want to tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm an engineer and I work, of course, at Oklahoma State University, do research in the area of grain storage and the equipment and uh, procedures to, to keep that grain in the best quality that we can until it ends up with the uh, actually the end user, a person who eats it on their tables. So uh, that's the kind of research I do. I've been working with Wayne and his uh, gang for several years now. And there's such a close tie between the condition of our grain and how, safety, how safe that area, area is to work in. Uh, if everything is going well in the grain bin, the grain's in good condition, the, uh, the structure is in good condition, we don't have that many accidents because there's no reason to be in there fixing anything. So if we keep our structures in good condition, our grain in good condition, then our, our accident rate goes down. We need to understand why, um, why our environment is so dangerous. Those of us who have been around grain all our lives, um, how many of you have been in a bin and walked on grain? I can raise my hand. We've all done it, haven't we? If either in the grain buggy or in the combine or in the bin. Uh, that was just, that was one thing I always looked forward to as a child. I looked forward to harvest because I got to play in the, in the grain buggies and in the combine back in the, in the trough. That's something we just can't do anymore. And the reason is we handle grain so much faster and we're in so much of a hurry now that accidents happen. Uh, when an auger runs, it moves grain five times faster than it did when I was little. I've dated myself here, but um, you know, accidents just happen so much faster than they used to that we can't take that risk anymore. But let's talk about what happens in a, in a grain bin when we store grain. Our job in storage is to maintain the quality of that product uh, after harvest and before it's in use, before it hits the table. Um, that saves us dollars and it makes it uh, a safer working environment too. The reality of it is that grain quality never improves in storage. It may stay the same or it may get worse, but it never improves. Now you may add value to it by, um, by marketing or by doing some kind of processing to it, uh, reduction of size or mixing that you're never going to improve the, the grain quality itself. So we need to know how to, uh, to keep it from going bad in storage. We can't improve it, but we can sure keep it from getting worse. Come on. These are things you don't want to see. It's kind of hard to see with the door open. These are things you don't want to see in your grain bin. Most of them have to do with moisture. Um, now, if all you've got to put in the bin is wet grain, then that's something you're going to have to deal with. But we want to keep it as dry as we can once it gets in there. This is a, a situation that would cause an avalanche. That's one of the, the ways that we have accidents. We've got grain stuck to the side of a wall. This is a big clump of mold. Um, these are stalagmites. Probably came from a drip from the, the roof. And that's a solid... Uh, column of grain right there. This uh, actually was uh, self-combustion. The grain got wet, heated itself up, and actually set itself on fire. And this is, uh, this is a temperature cable going down in the middle of a bin, and some water has dripped down that cable and started its own mold clump right there. And that's large enough that it won't go through the reclaim system. So it's going to stop up that system, somebody's going to have to break that loose, and probably somebody will enter the bin to break that loose so that we can get it out of the bin. So those aren't good days when you look inside and see that. So what causes these problems? There's two things that you have to manage in grain storage, and that's temperature and moisture. If you can handle your temperature and moisture, you've got the battle won. Uh, but this, it doesn't, it's not as easy as it sounds. But those are the two things that we have issues with. And most of it's caused by um, our climate. It's caused by cold fronts moving through. Um, I don't, I'm sure Canada is a lot like, even down in the southern part of the United States, you have these cold fronts that come through. You may have a 40 or 50 degree shift during the day when you have a weather front move through. Those changes are what give us problems. Those temperature fronts move through and uh, if the outside air is cooler than the inside air by uh, 20 degrees, there's going to be some condensation form. 
you just bet on it. That's just the laws of nature. There's going to be some water that forms. It comes out of the air, and its only chance is to go down onto the grate unless you've got an aeration system or enough ventilation in the roof that, uh, that you can move that, that condensation out. Just like the iced tea glass, you know, you take it out of the refrigerator in the hot summer and you sit it out on the kitchen table where it's warm. What happens on the outside of that glass? It gets wet, it's condensation. It's not coming out of the glass, it comes out of the air around it. The same thing happens in your grain when there's a difference in temperature between the air and the grain. Uh, it's gonna get that condensation on it. Or perhaps we load a different uh, moisture contents into the same bit. And where you have a change in moisture contents in your grain, there will be a level uh, or a layer of condensation there. Uh, over drying and shrink causes uh, the, the grain to break up, um, can cause the fines uh, to be spread out through your entire grain bulk. And anything time you have fines, the insects move in. Now here in Canada, you don't have the insect problem that we do down in the southern part of the United States, but it can still happen, you know that. Um, insects, the populations will form inside the grain bulk, inside the bin, and they just get bigger. Um, of course, they multiply, they have their own bodily functions in there, and that uh, area around their colonies is wet and uh, it heats up and that, that just grows and then the mold starts and then all of a sudden you've got a problem down in the middle of your grain bin that you didn't even know you had. Wayne was talking about um, the convection currents within a bin and uh, if, if you've ever been particularly in a concrete bin, uh, if you sat in, in there on top of the grain up at the top, there's enough air moving through there and that's a convection current that it'll blow your hat off in some cases. It really moves a lot of air through there, and it's just a temperature difference that moves that air through the bin. Well, what that does is it takes, if there's any moisture any place in that bin, it takes it and spreads it through the whole bin. So instead of just one area of the problem, now you've got moisture through the entire grain. So that can give us some problems. Um, you notice the clothes pin on this guy's nose here. The best sensor that you have to notice a problem is right here on your face. We all know what good grain's supposed to smell like. Okay? If it doesn't smell like that, you've got a problem. You need to figure out what's causing that odor. <clears throat> we can have hot spots down in our grain, and some, some products will do that on their own. Canola, I've seen a few uh, fields of canola uh, as I came up yesterday. Uh, canola is one of those products that will heat itself for about a month after harvest. It continues to respire uh, for four to six weeks after it's cut, and that just that physiological process uh, makes some heat. And that heat gets trapped down within the grain, and that will cause a, some mold to form. And in the case of an oil seed like canola, that causes the oil in it to go rancid. And then here in Canada, if it's over, I think, 1% free fatty acid, they're not going to buy it from you. So that's, that's the problem that we have with that particular pro product. Moisture migration, maybe you've got a leak in the bin. Heaven forbid that we didn't maintain our bins and we got a, a bolt hole that doesn't have a bolt in it and we're leaking water into the bin and maybe we don't even know it until we start to, to unload that grain. And then we've got the, a case where we've got an avalanche possibility on the sidewall. So those are all things that are related to, uh, to moisture and temperature, things that we need to be aware of in our bin, and those are the things that are gonna cause us problems that can eventually lead to an unsafe environment. As a, as a manager of grain storage, you need to be familiar with the product that you're storing and its, uh, its balance with relative humidity and moisture content. Every grain has its own set of laws where if you have a relative humidity and a temperature of the grain, there's a point at which they were balanced, where no moisture goes out of the grain and no moisture goes into the grain. And that's what, that you want to keep your product as close to that balance as you can. You do that with aeration and, and then the dryer before you put the, the crop in. But this kind of information is available on the web for every product that you'd ever want to store. 
Um, corn stores a little bit wetter than uh, soybeans does. Wheat is very forgiving. You've got a big range in there that's safe storage for, for wheat. Take home message is that the warmer the grain gets, um, the drier it needs to be to store safely. Okay? You know that intuitively because you've handled grain forever. But um, you, it, the cooler the temperature, the wetter the grain can be to store safely without having a lot of mold build up. So know, know the rules of your crop. If you've got a problem, where do you look for the answers in that bin? More and more I'm finding that our vendors are not uh, uh, putting in enough roof fence in our bins, especially as they get larger. These 105 foot bins, really and bigger, really scare me. Because when I get a call of a problem um, where it's raining in a bin, I get the call, my, my bin's raining. Well, that tells me that there's condensation up under the roof and it's coming down on the grain and that tells me there's not enough ventilation up in the head space of that bin. Probably not enough uh, air vents, uh, either the, the passive ones, the elbow vents or the mushroom vents or power vents, or maybe they're not working properly. Uh, maybe uh, the birds made a nest in it, can't get any air through it, or maybe they're not put in the right places. I uh, need to look at the aeration system. Have you changed crops from what that aeration system was designed uh, for? If you've changed from corn down to maybe something like canola. Canola has four times the static pressure as what corn does. Static pressure is the back pressure on the fan, how hard it is to get the air up through that product. So if you have a system that's designed for corn, or for wheat, it's not going to handle canola. If you have a system designed for corn, it may not even handle wheat. Wheat is twice that of what corn is, the static pressure. So we need to make sure we have enough aeration uh, designed for the product that we're storing. Maybe we're not monitoring carefully enough. Maybe it's a year where we've got a lot of t uh, weather fronts coming through, a lot of temperature changes. We may have to monitor differently than what we've done before. I'm a real firm believer in temperature cables, and especially in the larger bins. Uh, how else do you know what's going on down in the middle of that product? So they're a good investment. Our economists say they'll pay for themselves in two years, and then you've got them for several years. Uh, it does take more management, but you've got a, a head start on knowing whether there's a problem in your bin. So different ways of detecting problems uh, are appropriate <coughs> for different years. Now this is something you can do something about. You don't even have to, to spend a lot of money to do it. And that's your housekeeping. Uh, how clean is your handling equipment? If you've got uh, your grain buggies and your augers that sat uh, in the off season with grain in it, there may have been some insects that moved into it over, over the downtime. Well, where are those insects gonna go when you put the new crop through it? Right into your fresh grain. And so you've opened the door for a problem with insects before you ever got it into the bin. Or maybe there's some fines or some, um, gosh, heaven forbid, weeds growing into that grain buggy. Would never happen to anybody in here, I'm sure. But um, I've seen it happen. And so we've already got some foreign material that goes right into our new crop. So uh, get out the brooms and get out the scoop shovels and, and get out your, your uh, shop backs and, and do some sanitation. Um, this grain that's spilled right out here around this access hole, um, that's an open invitation for insects. It's also a safety problem. Down in the U.S., of course, we have to deal with OSHA. If OSHA were to come out and see that, they would write a ticket for it. Because it's a safety hazard, there's a slick surface there. There's grain spilled. Um, that's that's going to cost us some money right there just from a fine. If you don't clean up the old grain out of these bins, uh, that's a good place for trash and insects to harbor for the next year's crop. Use your pest prevention, your, your uh, sprays, your external sprays. Make sure you've got the weeds taken down from around the, the outside of bins. Uh, helps with the, the rodent problem. Uh, I see we've got a bunch of rodent traps around uh, the buildings out here. That's really a good management practice. 
Now, I know nobody in this audience would ever do this, but I've seen people who do. In fact, I've done it myself. Shame on me. Got that last truckload come in, and gosh, I know I can get in that bin. Well, I've just created a lot of problems for myself up here, because if I have any condensation coming off that roof, which I know I'm going to have, and a seal bed especially, where's that condensation going to go? Right down in my grain. That's the only option it has. Even if I've got good roof vents, I don't have enough head space there to move that condensation out. So I have really made a problem for myself right here by overfilling that bin. Should never go uh, over the, the sidewall height, the eave height here. This should all be head space. Another problem that we have when you have a peak on your grain like this is that your aeration system doesn't work as well. Where do we usually have problems in the bin? Where's the, the center at the top, isn't it? Always. This is why um, the vines go to the center in the top. The trash goes out here to the sidewall. Uh, the vines go here to the middle. Well, this is a, a, a lot of back pressure on that fan. So the air is going to take the path of least resistance, kind of like your teenage kids take, take the path of least resistance. Air does the same thing. It can get through this grain a lot easier than it can get through this grain. So the place where we're going to have the most problems gets the least benefit from the aeration system. So if we take, if we level this top surface, that helps. If we were to core this, this uh, grain, and by coring, I mean every time you put a load in, take just a little bit back out. Uh, that levels that top surface, and it also pulls these spines back out. And then you can redistribute them out into the, the bulk or get rid of them if it's bad enough that you don't want to put it back in there. When we do aerate, we need to move that temperature front all the way through that grain bulk before you turn your fans off. That means even if you have a rainy day, it's, uh, this is a discussion point, I feel it's better to keep the fans running unless it rains for two weeks straight. You're going to get more good out of moving that temperature front on through than the harm it does with the, the high humidity. Most crops it takes at least 16 times longer to re-wet than it does to dry. Okay, That's just a violent, we don't know why it's that way, that's just the seed's nature of trying to preserve itself. But um, you're going to do more damage by stopping that temperature front in the middle of your grain bulk than what the damage you would do uh, by uh, the humidity in your grain. So what that does is it causes two temperature, temperatures to, to meet. If we were to stop our aeration system and we've got hot grain here and cool grain here, it's just like that iced tea glass, we're going to get condensation where the two meet. And that's a chance for a mold and clumps to form. So we want to move that aeration front all the way through. How long is that going to take? If you've got a tenth of a CFM per bushel, it's going to take about 150 hours of fan time. If you've got two tenths of a CFM per bushel, it takes half that. If you've got three tenths of a CFM per bushel, it takes a third of that for 50 hours. So you can kind of, that's a rough guess. So certain times of year it's faster, but that's a rough guess that would help. Get back to sizing these rift beds. This is just so important. Um, and I'll, I think that our old rules of thumb are, not, are just really not adequate, especially for our large bins now, or for our large bins. I think we need to, to take extra precaution. More is better. You don't want, this is not the time to cut costs. Don't cut costs on your roof fence. Uh, add a couple extra if you need to. Some of our old adages uh, of one square foot for a thousand CFM, um, two kinds of vents there, the elbow vents and the mushroom vents, we'll go quickly through this calculation. Your vendor is going to help you make that decision. Uh, it's easier to put them in when you build the bin, the bin than it is to add them later. But if you're having problems with the bin, that's the first place to look. Do I have enough uh, vent space? The power vents are really nice. Um, on the big vents, uh, the they're just essential. 
Uh, there's two sizes, 18 inch and 24 inch, um, and, and they are correlated with your aeration system. You need 25% more exhaust fan than what you do with your aeration system on sizing. The important thing about these are that they need to be turned on before your aeration system turns on. So most of your, uh, your vendors will put a time delay in the electronics and electricity, electricity supply to your fan motor that uh, the, the exhaust fan will turn on first and then the aeration fan will come on so it self protects itself. Um, you can really collapse a roof or do some roof damage if you don't have your exhaust fans on first. And of course the exhaust fans can run without the aeration system on too to clear out any moisture up in your headspace. One thing that your aeration does to help you uh, is it also can be used to control some insects. Uh, where you're far enough north up here that you can get your grain cooled down. Uh, of course you put it into the bin when it's a little cooler than we do too. But you can actually, if you can get your grain down below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, your insects are not going to do damage. They may be in there, but they're either going to die or they're going to go dormant. And they're not going to uh, do damage to your crop. So that's what this chart shows. Up here, where, places where we're comfortable, your insects are comfortable too. And they're doing what insects do to make more of them. Um, but if we get cooler down here, our mortality of insects is almost 100%. So you can get by without a lot of chemicals if you'll use aeration to cool your product. <clears throat> we talked about monitoring earlier. These are the things you want to look for, of course, is your temperature. Um, you want to be sure that you know what the temperature is in your bin, in the grain, because if it's heating up above what the ambient or the outside temperature is, there's some kind of micro, micro something going on in your, your bin. Some kind of micro, bio, biological activity. It could be insects, it could be mold, it could be that crop hitting itself. Uh, but you need to know that it's going on in there. If, if it's the temperature in your grain is going up, but the temperature outside is going down, you've got a problem. You need to start looking to find out what it is. Some kind of moisture problem or a mold or insects. Um, rodents are always a problem, usually on the outside of bins. They don't see too much inside the bin, but they can certainly do some damage. Why monitor? You can't manage what you don't know is there. Okay, if, you don't, if you don't know, how are you going to fix it? So we need to be able to detect these problems ahead of, ahead of the problem. When things go wrong, that's when we have an unsafe environment. That's when we get the bridging. Corn is, is really susceptible to bridging. Uh, avalanches can happen in any crop. Uh, the avalanche is where you've got the grain stuck to the side of the bin. But the key is, if you've kept that grain in good condition, uh, you know what's in your bins, even if you know that it's in bad condition, you can take the precautions to keep yourself safe. Uh, if you have to go into the bin, I'd, I'd like to say we won't ever have to go into a bin, but we all know eventually we do. And so if we know there's a problem in there, then we know how to keep ourselves safe. Saves lives and saves dollars, too, when you go to market your product. Uh, one of the, the pieces of equipment that you'll look at this afternoon when you go outside uh, are coffer dams, and Wayne already talked a little bit about those. Um, we've done some testing at OSU to determine some of the forces required to put these coffer dams down into grain. But the idea is, uh, like when you played in the sandbox when you were a kid, you kept trying to make the pile bigger and the, the sand just kept falling back into the hole. Well, grain does the same thing. And when you're a victim and trapped in there, any movement can make more grain fall down on top of you, and there's just not any way to get that grain away from you unless you put a dam around someone. So there's several different models of these uh, coffer dams. Let me get to the picture here. Something as simple as one sheet of plywood cut into four pieces can be a coffer dam. There is no reason to not have a coffer dam. Uh, you could use pieces of corrugated metal. Um, I've heard of people using trash cans with the bottom cut out of it. Uh, you can make a coffer dam if you need to. Or I think we're going to have one of these GSI uh, versions out here this afternoon too. This is kind of like the Cadillac of the line. The KC Supply one is right there with it. It's not quite as heavy, but it's built a lot the same way. 
Um, but those are, they do the same thing as the plywood do, does, they're just a little easier to use. Uh, they've got the nice latches on them. But the, the idea is to put something around a victim and be able to scoop the grain off of that victim enough where you can make the victim a little more comfortable uh, and, and get that victim out of the, the grain. You're not going to be able to pull somebody directly out of the grain. It may take 800 pounds if he's up to here, buried in grain. And I wouldn't want 800 pounds pulling on me. That, that's going to do more damage than the grain's done. So we've got to move that grain, get the force off of our victims so we can get him out of the grain and the copper dams is how you're going to do that. Okay, with that, kind of summarize what we just talked about. Proper storage and handling, training of yourself and the people who work for you so they know what to look for, uh, the proper equipment, having a copper dam available if you need it. It may live down at the, uh, at the firehouse, the fire department that serves your area or maybe one of your neighbors that has a lot of uh, a, a company like, like this one uh, will have a, a copper dam available. Have it available, know where it is, and know how to use it. Gives us a safer work environment.